I will symbolically transform myself from presenter to uh, interlocutor by putting on a hat. Thank you so much. Um, two years ago, when I had the pleasure of being here, Adam was interviewing me in his office, and I saw a cap which said, make J.S. Mill great again, and I so fell in love with it that he actually gave it to me. And um, it's, I've been asked to wear it for profiles in the Wall Street Journal, for podcast interviews. It's really, and it's going to be distributed with thanks to IH21 oh, really? by a free speech organization in the United States called FIRE, the well, Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression. Well, I, I didn't actually know that there was, uh, there was finalized. That, that, that is great honor. Uh, I would actually use the cap as a sort of a springboard mm -hmm. to, to, our, to our start because, you know, it says, make John Stuart Mill great again. John Stuart Mill being the author of the famous essay on liberty that has uh, the chapter on liberty of free discussion and, and thought. Uh, when, you say, when we say, make John Stuart Mill uh, great again, it almost sounds as if he's not too great at the moment. What, what uh, would you... Well, in fact, I made an editorial suggestion on the cap which illustrates that. It, the original said, make J.S. Mill great again. And as I commented to you, Adam, many of my friends saw the cap and were mystified. They said, who is J.S. Mill? And I had to explain. And I've spoken to students in the United States who are studying philosophy, who have not studied anything by John Stuart Mill. So for those of us who do think that On Liberty continues to be the most persuasive statement of why we should defend freedom for all thought, especially thoughts that we disagree with, why we should debate everything, especially those ideas that we are tempted to think should be beyond debate. Uh, please go back to J.S. Mill and argue with him if you can. I so far Definitely. continue to be persuaded. Yeah, abs absolutely. It is, it is a great book, by the way. You can also find it over there. Uh, but, and <laughs> I'll, st I'll stop <laughs> selling, selling the things that we've done from, from now on, I promise. Um, uh, however, uh, it, it seems that it's not only the ideas that perhaps people don't recognize, but or perhaps even the traditions or customs or institutions that were founded on those uh, principles that were hard, hard won and articulated by John Stuart Mill. Uh, our dear friend Jacob Shangama, who was here last year, he even talks uh, about uh, a phenomenon. He says that we, we're going through a sort of free speech recession, and not only in the authoritarian world, but also... Uh, in, in Western democracy. What, what, what would you say about that? Uh, unfortunately, I do agree with my colleague and friend, Jakob, and it is a worldwide phenomenon. In some ways, perhaps even more problematic in societies such as yours and mine, where free speech is relatively strongly protected, such that we tend to take it for granted. Uh, I have some colleagues who work in more authoritarian countries, and they are so um, puzzled at the disregard with which liberals and progressives in the United States, in particular, regard free speech, dismissing it at best as a tool for the powerless to entrench the status quo, at worst uh, as something that is antithetical to social justice. And my friends who have dealt with actual censorship hypothesize, well, maybe it's easy to dismiss it if you really can rely on it as a safety net, ultimately. Actually, that, that provides me a nice segue because I, uh, I, want to, I don't know if, I, if I've emailed you about this, but um, in 2021, after your book came out uh, in the Czech Republic, there was, a, there was a review of the book on the Czech radio, which was generally very, very positive, and I really liked how they, how they summed up the major arguments. However, it, it finished with a, a bit of a caveat to the reader and, uh, because it said that the book is great, but the reader needs to bear in mind that it is a very conservative and a very American 
perspective yeah. on free speech. And I wanted to ask you about that. Do you consider yourself a conservative uh, thinker, I do, scholar? I do consider myself an American, but I don't consider this to be a particularly American perspective. So let me get back to that. But on the first point, I uh, describe myself, if I'm uh, forced to put myself in political terms, definitely a political liberal. And I, I do find it kind of... Um, not surprising in the sense that in the United States, freedom of speech recently has more vocally, more strongly been associated with conservatives for one major reason. Uh, on college campuses where a lot of these debates have taken place, every survey shows that the uh, student body and the faculty are overwhelmingly liberal. And since we all tend to support freedom of speech for me, but not for thee, the perspectives that tend to be suppressed on campuses are conservative viewpoints. And so who is invoking freedom of speech rights but conservatives? Um, and But the, the truth of the matter is that freedom of speech should be, and this is true under international human rights law, uh, the law of other countries as well as the United States, so my perspective is not uh, uniquely American by any stretch of the imagination. Freedom of speech is viewpoint and content neutral no matter, and also uh, identity neutral, no matter who you are, whatever demographic pigeonhole society might put you into, no matter what you believe as a matter of politics, religion, philosophy, you are entitled to and really depend on robust freedom of speech, the freedom to develop your own sense of identity to explore your own ideas and the freedom to engage in the debates that are constitutive of our democratic republics. Yeah, it makes me think of uh, the free speech movement that arose in Berkeley in the 1960s, right? There was, uh, ever, I mean, until recently, I saw free speech more of a sort of left-wing value because it was so valuable for uh, the the progress of the movements in the past but all of a sudden it sort of it sort of changed well, but you know the political tides change which is exactly why if you want to have freedom of speech for me you have to defend it for thee and in fact um, one can predict and looking back at history can verify that whoever is challenging the status quo Whoever lacks majority power, that individual or that group is the one that especially depends on freedom of speech because by definition, you don't have access to the majoritarian branches of government. You depend on the individual right to raise your own voice, to dissent, to protest, and throughout American history, we went through most of our history, by the way, without having strong protection of freedom of speech. That did not, um, uh, did not gain protection from the United States Supreme Court until the 1960s. No coincidence, the Supreme Court that was very strongly supportive of the civil rights movement um, also, for the first time, strongly protected freedom of speech and the landmark free speech cases, almost without exception, arose from the civil rights movement because every sensorial tool, whether it be defamation lawsuits or breach of the peace actions um, or so-called time, place, and manner restrictions, restrictions against subversive speech or emotionally traumatizing speech, all of the buzzwords that are now being invoked, uh, mostly to suppress conservative perspectives, were used to suppress civil rights protesters. Most people know that Martin Luther King wrote a historic letter 
from the Birmingham jail, but most people have no idea why he was in jail. He was imprisoned for trying to exercise what we now, but not then, consider to be the most fundamental free speech right in a democracy, and that is for individuals to peacefully object to, criticize, and try to reform government policy. Uh, and that was in a long line of suppressed reform speech, going back to abolitionists, women suffragists, anti-war protesters, the gay rights movement, and so forth. So I would make the argument that it's anybody who's advocating for social change, certainly including progressive and liberal social change, who especially depends on robust freedom of speech. Thank you, thank you for that. I, I, I wanted to push you a little bit on the, you know, free speech is a sort of a particularly American thing to, uh, to have because this is an object, uh, an objection that we do encounter quite frequently when we do uh, advocacy in the Czech Republic. And we use your arguments, which, by the way, have been a godsend to us because it was so well articulated and we just uh, we, we use them in our analysis and in, in uh, uh, the evaluations of policy and so on. But one, one of the arguments that keeps repeating, especially as it relates to hate and hateful uh, comments or... Uh, or, or speech of any kind, is that, you know, the argument goes as follows. It's, it sort of says, okay, in America, you can have these very liberal, uh, uh, I mean, sort of permissive laws and protections. However, America never experienced anything like the horrors of the Second World War, the Holocaust, and so on. And we need to be prepared to defend uh, certain communities against hateful attacks even if it means you know, partial suppression of free speech because we never ever want anything like the Holocaust to happen again. How would you, how would you respond to that? How would you re respond to this European, uh, I don't know, sort of uniqueness kind of argu argument? Well, in terms of not wanting a Holocaust, not wanting anti-Semitism, genocide, any form of hateful violence, Europe is not unique with all due respect. Uh, I think that's a universal goal, and certainly uh, one that I have not only as an American, but as the daughter of a Holocaust survivor, uh, whom all barely survived Buchenwald, having been born in Germany as a so-called half-Jew. More directly to the point to American law, let me cite the person who was the head of the American Civil Liberties Union, the organization which famously or infamously came to the defense of the right of neo-Nazis to demonstrate in Skokie, Illinois, many of you have heard of this case because it's kind of a paradigmatic case about what you call the American perspective, but I would say is the universal free speech perspective of viewpoint neutrality. And Skokie, Illinois, near Chicago, is a town that not only had a large Jewish population at the time, a large percentage of the occupants were Holocaust survivors. Arie Nair, the executive director of the ACLU, which led the fight, successful fight in the courts for free speech rights for neo-Nazis, was himself born in Germany as a Jew in 1933. His entire extended family was assassinated by the Nazis. His immediate family managed to escape, and Arie wrote an entire book about this. It's a, a fabulous book called Defending My Enemy, and he says, I defend free speech for neo-Nazis, not despite the Holocaust, but because of it. Jews are always going to be a minority. We are never going to have majority power. The only thing that we can depend on, the only source that we have for raising our voices, for seeking protection, for seeking equality, for seeking human dignity, are the First Amendment freedoms uh, of petition and assembly and association. He also said this, which I think is, and it's a paraphrase, but 
pretty close paraphrase. Um, he said, you know, I love free speech, but I loathe the Nazis even more than I love free speech. So if I were convinced that censoring the Nazis would have prevented their rise to power, would have prevented the Holocaust, I would have been in favor of it. And let me add to that, Adam, that that's the United States Supreme Court position. Because freedom of speech is not absolute, even under the First Amendment. Freedom of speech may be restricted if government can satisfy the appropriately heavy burden of proving that the restriction would be effective and necessary to prevent some great harm. So if you could show that further speech restrictions beyond what we already allow um, would have kept Hitler from coming to power or would prevent another Hitler from coming to power, that would be constitutional. And what's not known is that in the Weimar Republic, there were strict anti-hate speech laws that were very strictly enforced, even according to the leading Jewish organizations at the time. And their conclusion was that, and, and there were many prosecutions, including of Nazis, including of the pub, Julius Streicher, the publisher of that virulently anti-Semitic Der Sturma. And, um, and they loved it because these became propaganda platforms for them to gain attention that they otherwise would not have received and sympathy that they otherwise would not have garnered. Yeah, it's, it's hard to follow up after this. It's, uh, yeah. Um, I, but you mentioned one principle that I think is really handy when, uh, when defending the freedom of speech because uh, often we are, we are faced with this false dichotomy that either you are for free speech and then you, then you think that anything goes or you, you know, or you are, you should be open to these, uh, you know, hate speech laws or anti -dis uh, anti disinformation legislation and so on. But you, you did mention uh, clear and present danger or the, uh, what is, what is the, where's the, where's the boundary? And thank you so much for that, Adam, because. You know, public opinion surveys show that many people in my country are very, and so this, by the way, if I can put a parenthetical, this goes to the American position versus Europe. Um, actually, what I find is not only in the United States, but all the many other countries in Europe and beyond where I discuss these issues, that there are some people who are really strongly supportive of free speech. And there are some people who are very strongly opposed to free speech. The ACLU and the Supreme Court position uh, do not necessarily have a majority support within the United States. Uh, but uh, those who are skeptical about free speech everywhere tend to have a distorted, ex caricatured version of it. I can't tell you how often I've been told, oh, you free speech defenders, you're absolutists, and you will never allow the government to impose any restrictions whatsoever, or you deny that free speech can ever do any harm. None of that is true. And really, the debate is not over whether there can and should be restrictions on free speech, but rather, what should the restrictions be? What should the burden of proof be on the government in order to justify the restrictions? And I already alluded to this, but um, a, a term that we often use in the United States to say when speech restrictions are justified is the emergency principle. When the restriction is necessary to prevent imminent harm that is directly caused by the speech, as opposed to the standard that we used to have until the 1960s and the civil rights movement, as I mentioned earlier, and which is more typical of some other countries, is the so-called bad tendency test. Well, looser connection between the speech and some indirect potential harm that it might cause. And believe me, I am the first one to understand the powerful impact of speech and even speech that does not pose an emergency can certainly 
contribute and lead to great harm. I just continue to believe, and I say continue to, because in the spirit of Mill, maybe you can persuade me to change my mind, but so far I continue to believe that it is even more harmful to give the government the additional power, the additional discretion, the additional latitude to punish speech because of that more indirect connection to harm. It is that discretion that has consistently been used to suppress the civil rights demonstrators and the anti-slavery uh, demonstrators and others who were challenging the status quo. And from the perspective of the powers that be, certainly seemed harmful. Thank you. I, um, I can't ignore one particular aspect that changed uh, last year on the, on the uh, on the 24th of February when, when Russia aggressively invaded Ukraine. And we had this uh, big public discussion whether or not we should put in place anti-disinformation legislation because uh, while I would say that when you've got instances where, as you mentioned, you have a specific imminent and serious harm that, it, uh, that is pre present within a speech act, then I, that I think is not controversial to uh, to subject to some sort of restriction or repression even, uh, we most certainly in the online space have propaganda narratives that are clearly pro-Russian. Uh, often they may be even organized by, uh, by foreign agents that are actively trying to promote this aggressive regime, uh, but they don't cross the threshold, right? There are these insidious narratives that slow, more, more, a lot of people would say that they are, they are slowly uprooting the basis of democracy and, and uh, the support for, for example, for our Western alliances with the NATO and so on and so forth. Now, does that, does that change uh, when it comes to uh, whether these should be allowed or not? Uh, absolutely not. Some of the worst experiences of censorship that we had in the United States before the Supreme Court adopted its speech protective stance were precisely uh, to fight communism. We had the Red Scare in my country uh, in the World War I era, which is what gave rise to the founding of the ACLU because you know, 15,000 people were arrested and imprisoned, including ministers and members of the clergy for peacefully um, objecting to the United States war effort and for supporting the Soviet revolution. In the McCarthy period in the 1940s and, and 50s, actually all the way up to the early 1960s, we had people who were losing their uh, positions, not only in the private sector, but at public universities even. And, and this is with the blessing of the United States Supreme Court, which accepted exactly that possibility. You know, uh, and the, the most infamous case from my perspective, going back to 1961, is when the United States Supreme Court upheld the criminal conviction of a group of college professors for having taught classic Marxist works, works by Marx and Engels in college classes. And the rationale was, you know, students will read this, they might be persuaded to adopt the ideas that might lead them to support the overthrow of the United States government, that might lead to the overthrow of the United States government. So I, I wanted to get my program here, Adam, because you had two wonderful speakers that uh, I was privileged to hear about this concept of disinformation, Sasha Alte and Radek Schlup. And you know, th they were so fascinating to me because the, among other things, they illustrated that disinformation might not be nearly as harmful as we tend to think that it is, not so influential. We don't give enough credit to our fellow members of our society to ignore it, right, or, or refute it, uh, or to do their own research and put the lie to it. And also the point that to the extent people do succumb to what we might consider to be dangerous ideas, 
that that might not be a matter of rational debate and censorship is not necessarily going to solve that problem. These may be emotional or psychological problems. Do you hear about disinformation in America? Because interestingly enough, one of the most common arguments that I hear when, when people argue against, uh, uh, against our position, which is, which is generally pro-free speech, um, and, and um, we're trying to look for other ways how to, how to deal with disinformation, like, like counter-speech, like something that you mentioned, mentioned in your book. But one of the examples that just keeps popping up again and again is the example of your last presidential elections. Mm -hmm. Because till this day, uh, a lot of people are not persuaded that the elections were legitimate. And the argument goes, well, look at what happened in America. Now, you know, the fundament of democracy, namely elections that needs, you know, uh, that, that uh, are there to secure the peaceful transition of power, all of a sudden the legitimacy has been weakened by disinformation. How would you answer these people? You know, it makes me think of an old saying that we had during the Vietnam War. This is going to be history to the young people in the audience where uh, the United States was accused of, and in some cases the evidence was undeniable, of um, destroying villages of civilians. And there was an infamous statement, we had to destroy the village in order to save it. I can't think of anything more antithetical to democracy than the government deciding that certain speech is misleading enough or untrue enough or dangerous enough uh, that the government has to suppress we, the people, who wield the sovereign power from having access to it. To me, that's you know, for the sake of preserving democracy, we're going to destroy the very foundation of democracy. The uh, First Amendment law wisely does, consistent with the emergency principle, allow government to restrict certain objectively, you know, falsifiable statements of fact that directly cause specific harm consistent with the emergency principle. Defamation is an example, fraud is an example, perjury is an example. By definition, when we use these slippery concepts of disinformation or misinformation, 99% um, of the time, uh, including a lot of the allegations that you're talking about, Adam, there's an admixture not only of you know, verifiable or falsifiable facts, but it's always admixed with interpretations, perspectives, analysis, opinion, where people can and should disagree with each other and debate each other. The Supreme Court has said there's no such thing as a false idea under the Constitution, right? And in a case in which it recently struck down uh, legislation that was trying to outlaw certain kinds of lies that did not uh, meet with that, that, that emergency standard. The court referring to Orwell's famous 1984 said, we have no need for a ministry of truth in our democracy. Yeah, well, um, coming back to Europe for a little bit, because... Um, um, we often find ourselves in a, in a bit of a pickle because the, you know, when we read the arguments, they, they seem fairly clear and the way how, how eloquently you present them, that, that's something that uh, really does make a you know, big impression on, on, on how I see the problem and so on. However, it seems uh, to, at least in Europe, it seems to be increasingly a minority position because uh, especially in the area of hate speech laws, I remember... Uh, now we've got a proposal of a Danish law, I think, that is aimed at uh, banning an improper treatment of um, objects, ob objects of uh, important religious significance and so on, uh, which would, uh, um, in principle, criminalize, for example, the Bible-tearing incidents that you described in your book, 
in in Poland, and also I think there's a uh, there's a push to to harmonize the laws regarding hate speech across Europe, so that um, so that it sort of fits uh, well into the whole. Uh, what's your view on the future of free speech in Europe? Uh, again, it's uh, 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 so, so. Let me say on the, this particular proposal, I've been working very closely with my friend and colleague and yours, Jakob Vichangama, who is Danish and who now works in the United States but continues to do uh, activism all over the world. And I want to emphasize that you know Denmark only quite recently repealed its blasphemy laws. I think it was within the last 10 years, uh, Jakob took a leading uh, role in doing that. And he's now uh, engineering a petition drive of many people in Denmark, as well as in the United States and around the world to um, oppose uh, rolling back. Let me say just um, two days ago, I'm losing track of time, two days ago I was uh, speaking in Philadelphia at the National Constitution Center. We are celebrating, thank you for having this wonderful event on what is Constitution Day in the United States, celebrating our, our Constitution. And the first speak, the ratification of the Constitution, the first speaker was Salman Rushdie, uh, has lived in the United States for many years, but originally from India and the UK. So he could not have been more eloquent in speaking against the revival of these blasphemy laws. And, you know, he made many powerful points, including that, uh, uh, you know, you don't make the ideas go away by criminalizing them. And he used a wonderful phrase as a writer. I mean, it just came out of his speaking, but I, I remembered the phrase. He said, um, you give the glamour of the taboo, the glamour of the taboo to the expression that is being punished. You know, the same thing has happened with the, uh, the Nazis in the Weimar Republic. Our goal, of course, is to suppress hateful ideas and attitudes. That's why I wrote my book. I mean, the title of the book is Hate, Why We Should Resist It with Free Speech, Not Censorship. My goal was to resist it, but to resist it effectively. And ironically, speech suppression, rather than suppressing the idea that we are hoping to persuade our fellow human beings to abandon, tends to amplify it and give it more power and resonance among those who are disposed toward it and make it harder for law enforcement to monitor the conversations, to look for plots of actual violence. So we get a lot of law enforcement officials who oppose censoring hate speech and extremist speech for that reason. I could talk to you for hours, but I think at this point I would like to give the opportunity to, uh, to the audience to, uh, to ask questions. So we've got we've got two questions right here, but no microphone. So I'll, uh, I think I'll do this first. Then. There you go. Adam, I poprosím o přeložení. Víš na co se zeptám? Já bych se Nadin Štrosen chtěl zeptat na fenomén paniky elit. Uh, což my jsme si prožili 25. 6. února minulého roku, kdy došlo k vypnutí nějakých webů a vlastně, když to člověk veme racionálně, tak to nedávalo smysl, protože všechny tři ústavní jaksi parametry to nenaplňovalo, nevedlo to k, té, k zamýšlenému účinu, existovaly jiné způsoby a zároveň každý, kdo se podívá na tu situaci, tak ví, že tím útokem silně poklesla účinnost ruské propagandy. Poklesla. Přirozeně. A přesto panika elity znamenala, že se zavedlo opatření zcela mimo právo. Čili ten, ta panika elity, která je překvapena, zaskočena něčím a najednou udělá cokoliv, hraje v tom silnou roli. Tak jestli je možný to převyprávět, co chci říci. Thank you. The question is about the phenomenon of elite panic. Uh, and as an illustration, uh, our dear friend and colleague was, was using an example that happened last year on the 25th of February, right after the Russian aggression uh, on Ukraine, where uh, several so-called disinformation websites were, were blocked um, by 
by the internet providers, but but probably with, with instructions from the government. It's we're, we're actually having a lawsuit about this this whole thing. So so it's it is not clear what exactly happened. Uh, however, it it seems quite strange because uh, surely at that point when Russia attacked the credibility of the regime that was that was always trying to make itself seem as if they're just you know, being being oppressed by everybody else, and they never wanted to commit any any aggression. Surely, the, the credibility went down. However, at that point, everybody thought this is the time when we need to ban all these websites because all of a sudden they are uh, they are somehow more of a threat. So, so th that's an illustration of elite panic. What do you think about elite panic as it relates to free speech? Can you clarify? I've heard the term, but I'm not exactly sure what it means. Uh, elite panic? Well, well, Sasha was talking about moral panic, essentially. It's, it's just, uh, would you like to define it? <laughs> um, so, so some famous moral panics were, for instance, about Dungeons and Dragons or like rock music, uh, you know, like Dungeons and Dragons, like corrupting the youth, like uh, rock and roll, like corrupting the youth. And, and every time you have a new technology, you have these kind of moral panics. Very, very clear. Um, I think to, to describe what it is, is kind of to answer it, it's a particular manifestation of that general tendency of free speech for me, but not for thee. And the interesting thing is that uh, those who want to censor a certain kind of speech that they see as being very dangerous, don't see it as dangerous to them they can steep themselves. So one example, I, I recently had to write a, a new preface for an old book uh, I wrote about pornography or sexual expression, which is a good example of expression that is far more restricted in the United States than in Europe or the rest of the world. Um, and we have uh, from both the rat, so-called radical feminists on the left and Christian and cultural conservatives on the right, agree that sexual expression is very, very dangerous for somewhat different reasons, but they, they agree, and there are now serious efforts, again, to restrict sexual expression online in the United States. But the advocates of doing it steep themselves in the pornography. I mean, study it, report on it, describe it, and all for purposes of telling other people that you are really going to be harmed if you look at it. You know, we become better and nobler people by looking at it, but not you. Yeah, I think it reminds me, I, th I think Samuel Johnson was the one who uh, published the, the dictionary. Is that, is that him? Yeah, uh, there's this story when uh, a couple of old ladies came to him and he said, uh, Mr. Johnson, we have to congratulate you because you didn't include any swear words in your dictionary and he said well thank you for trying to look them up it's, uh, so yeah. all right any other questions um, there was uh, during uh, COVID times there was one extremist proponent of extreme COVID measures saying that oh this free speech or freedom is something abstract it's not important now we need to save human lives so we need to restrict our free speech and all these things which obviously is, is a terrible abuse using fear to manipulate people. And, um, but it's also it is very difficult. What in your experience is the best answer to this kind of manipulations? It's a freedom of speech is always sought to be restricted in the name of some countervailing goal, which is always a really important goal. Public health. Welfare of children, national security, democracy. Nobody can quarrel with the importance of those goals, which is why the second part of the criterion for satisfying the emergency restriction is so important. And that is, is the restriction actually effective and even necessary in promoting that goal. And another uh, element uh, to clarify that the restriction must be necessary, is there any less speech restrictive alternative measure that would be at least as effective in promoting that goal? And 99.99% of the time, it turns out 
that restricting the speech isn't even effective in advancing the goal, let alone the necessary to do so. And we've already given some examples that, and in fact, it goes back to these great talks we had about disinformation. You're not going to actually counter the negative ideas or promote democracy or public health by suppressing speech. In fact, we already know from the COVID experience that, thank goodness, there wasn't complete suppression of what were some unorthodox ideas at the time that at least in my country were booted off social media and we now learn had a lot of scientific validity. The whole science, I mean the scientific method is really what J.F. Mill was talking about. Everything is a hypothesis, it has to be subject to debate and discussion and attempt to counter prove it. And not only are we thereby promoting free speech, but we're promoting the science that underlies effective public health measures. We've got another question over there. Mně se velmi líbilo, Madame Strossen, co jste povídala o tom městečku v Illinois, kde je velká židovská menšina a přesto příslušník té menšiny horoval pro svobodu slova. Teď řeknu něco z Evropy. V Německu jsou nejsilnější zákony, které se týkají navazování na, na ty myšlenky eh, nacismu a tak dále. A přesto v současné době druhá nejsilnější strana v Německu je Alternative für Deutschland, která tyto myšlenky svým způsobem prezentuje. Proto je strašně nutné zachovat svobodu slova za každých podmínek. I heard a reference to Alternative for Deutschland, AFD, yeah. All right, just to quickly translate, um, um, the, the example of Skokie in Illinois was great, that was, that was mentioned. Uh, and also, uh, um, in contrast, you have the example of Germany that is quite stringent when it comes to suppressing uh, speech. Uh, it's, got very, uh, it's got fairly stringent hate speech laws. But when you look at the results, the the second well the second leading party at the moment is the AFD, um, and that's why it's important to preserve free speech. Was there? Byla tam otázka nebo? Jsi tam byla otázka nebo jsem něco zapomněl? Byla to otázka a vlastně i statement, že svoboda slova je důležitější pro potlačování těchto myšlenek. All right, okay. Does that suggest then that perhaps? Uh, uh, the free speech alternative is even better for the suppression of these insidious uh, access. Yeah, it's, I, I think it's probably difficult to um, absolutely prove what the empirical result will be because there are so many different variables. But you know, to your point, it is absolutely true that not only in Germany, but many other European countries that very strictly suppress hate speech, we have seen a rise of violence and discriminatory violence against Jews, against uh, Roma, against um, immigrants, against refugees, uh, the rise of explicitly racist parties such as the AFD, is very troubling, so it's very clear that those strict laws do not correlate with sufficiently repressing hateful and discriminatory ideas. Now, here's the but point. I was in a debate a few years ago in Brussels with Vera Yourova, the E, yeah, yeah, I think of her as the censorship czar. I know that's Do not the really? official okay. title. Okay. Uh, and, and, and my conclusion was these laws are not effective. You should get rid of them. And her conclusion was these laws are not effective. We need more of them. So, and honestly, I've asked social scientists, is there any way that we can uh, 
you know, conclusively prove this, and they've said, you know, it's just much too complicated. But I think that what we can say is there's no correlation between these strict hate speech laws and repressing hate speech, hateful, I, even the speech itself, let alone violent and hateful conduct. And in the United States, it's really an interesting counterfactual. Um, we used to have hate speech laws in the United States before the 1960s when the Supreme Court strongly protected freedom of speech, including for hate speech. And you, at the time that we restricted hate speech was at the time that we had Jim Crow laws and racial discrimination by law, racial segregation by law, and the protection of free speech for hate speech conversely accompanied the dismantling of segregation and government discrimination. It, it actually reminded me of, uh, I, I think it's an argument in your book also, that, uh, I mean, as uh, imperfect as the, you know, as, as, as the state of human beings is, uh, there is, there will always be conflict. The, the striving to completely eliminate conflict is, I think, just hopeless and completely naive. The, the, the question is, what is the best way of conflict resolution? And the thing is, discussion or even uh, in speech may be harmful in particular ways, but it is still a fairly good compromise in comparison with conflict resolution by the means of violence. And I think what may happen, I, th I think this is Lee Bowling, the Canadian legal theorist, who says that free speech also works as a sort of pressure release, right? If, you, if, you, if you're perceiving a particular problem and you can't even talk about it because you're facing, uh, facing a potential repression uh, from the position of power, you know, being pushed to the corner one day you may just 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 go all the way because it doesn't really matter and use violence to uh, to address the conflict that you're feeling. Whereas when you got speech, it can be unpleasant, but at least nobody's getting hurt physically. You know, is that yeah? I, I think that's exactly right. And S Sigmund Freud supposedly said, at least it's been attributed to him, uh, that civilization began the first time that in order to uh, resolve a conflict instead of hurling a rock, man hurled words. Right. All right, we have time for one last question. Uh, and, okay, uh, I, I, the gentleman in the corner. Sorry if I missed anybody. Did I miss anybody? Uh, I, I, I missed you, sorry. <laughs> Thank you, Professor. Uh, few people realize that there is an inner contradiction in uh, hate speech laws. For example, if I claim that Czechs or Catholics or vegetarians are both stupid and lazy, I, well, some of them are, some of them are not. But if I am then accused of a hate speech and somebody claims that I should go to prison because of my speech, does not he or she spread hatred against me? Of course, he or she does, of course. You know, that's such a good point because in the United States, which is behind the rest of the um, democratic world in terms of being so overly, harshly punitive, we still have the death penalty, we have the mass incarceration, but thankfully, in the fairly recent past, there has been a really strong move across the political spectrum to roll back on that overly harsh, punitive approach towards something that's called restorative justice. And you have people and politicians at every level of government saying, we should not be so harshly punitive uh, we should not just lock up people, even people who have been convicted, of homicide. That's not an effective approach for reintegrating them as constructive members of our society. And yet at the same time, we have this increasingly punitive attitude toward people who say the wrong thing. <laughs> 
who un even unwittingly, unintentionally say something that's offensive or insensitive. And I often try to use that example, especially among my progressive friends. If you think that we should have a forgiving presumption of uh, innocence, reintegrative approach toward somebody's committed physical violence, for heaven's sake, why not with respect to somebody who said something that is perceived or even misperceived as hateful? All right, I'm afraid that's all the time we have. Nadine, thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, Professor Nadine Strassen.